Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. All right, last Sunday, Pastor Kim did an amazing job of talking about this marvelous word, grace. I, in my opinion, I don't know which it is more, love and grace are the two top words of the Christian faith. And I loved, Pastor, what you did with the mink coat. Because we need, through the eye gate as well as the ear, to see these beautiful, powerful words in a way that's so clearly understandable. And wasn't that? I mean, I was watching it online. I loved it. I saw the big white box here. It was obviously a present. And before he even got to it, I knew whatever is in there is all gift. You don't earn it. I mean, marvelous. I'm going to use it again. I will give you credit somewhere down the line. But it was, it was marvelous. Now today I'm going to build on that because I really appreciate this guy <laughs> so much and we are a magnificent team and I want to say that publicly. Pastor Kim, thank you for being partners with me and Agnes Day in this marvelous congregation. So today is All Saints and I want to talk about who is a saint, what is a saint and how does that work in our lives. So this is an old one but it's a good one. A little girl, a niece, is up in the sanctuary after a worship service like this, and her aunt took her to worship, and uh, her aunt liked to talk. And so after the service, she was talking with this woman and that guy, and her little niece was quite young and not quite as excited about all this. She wanted to go home, but she was looking, and in that particular church, there were lots of stained glass windows. And there were the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there was the Madonna and the Christ child. And there was the apostles, among other beautiful stained glass windows. This aunt was like Pastor Kim. Very, very savvy about how to talk about spiritual things. And she thought on a dime. And she said when her niece asked again, Who are all these people? In the, in the windows. She said, those are the saints. Yeah, but who are the saints, she said. And here's where it comes. The aunt says, saints are people through whom the light shines. Now, I want you to bear that in your heart during this homily because it's a framework. People through whom the light, not their light, God's light, shines through them, see? It's marvelous, because even though on the surface it sounds almost kiddish, you know, it's really deep when you think about it. Okay, today we're going to talk about the saints, which is you, and all the ones that we have lit candles for and remember, and that are in our Lutheran uh, commemoration and so forth. But we're gonna do it honestly, all right? We're going to do it as Luther was so honest, and many others, in this marvelous phrase, Latin, simul usus et peccator. And I only say that just to show you that I did go to seminary and I did <laughs> learn some things there. Simul usus et peccator, simultaneously saint and sinner. All wrapped up, by the way, all the time. Uh, yeah, and some of you are going to think about math, like I used to when I was a kid. Well, how much of me is saint, and how much is sinner? Don't go there. Uh, it's not that, you know, I'm 80% sinner and 20% saint. I'm 100% sinner. And I'm 100% saint because of Christ. Because of God. God's grace. Um, you know, don't, don't, these are paradoxes. You can't figure them out in the limited minds that we have, and we shouldn't have to try to. Trust it. Uh, Jesus, you already have an example of this paradox. Jesus was, let's see, human and divine. Was he 10% divine and 90% human? The church said early on, no. He's 100% divine and 100% human. 
And they figured all this out long before the Enlightenment when everything had to be data oriented and math figured out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let it go. It is a paradox. Okay. Um, and what this means is that, and you know this, you know in your own life and you know people in your family and especially in the media, we are capable, all humans, of magnificent things, beneficent things, loving deeds that could make you cry one day. And the next day we could do horrendous things or at least have awful and evil thoughts. Let's be honest. That's what Luther was trying to tell us. You are saint and sinner all wrapped up and you can't unwind them until that final day, the eschaton, the parousia, when God is all in all for all of creation and every tear, as we heard already, will be wiped away and we will be like him, second lesson says. But until that time, you're stuck with the sinner side of you, I'm sorry. But it gets better. Okay. Uh, my little, uh, I have a little uh, prop here. And I, I apologize ahead of time, you can't all see it, but um, some of you know my wife is a potter, and she made these Eucharistic vessels that we have, and she's marvelous. I learned this from her. The Japanese have a term called kintsukuri. Kintsukuri is a philosophy that you don't throw things out just because they become marred or chipped or even broken. That the life of an object is important, the history is important, and if there are chips and if it breaks, that's a part of the marvelous history of that object. Don't throw it out. Uh, we already heard that. A little child shall lead them, as the Bible says, and she already led us in this answer. All right, Kinsakuri. When it comes to a potter, if a potter accidentally breaks a pot, every bowl, every vase is called a pot in pottery. I had to learn that. The Japanese will take resin and gold, mix them together, and at the cracks, you can't see this, I'll have it over there at the, at the end when we all leave, uh, say, put the gold in and the final pot is more beautiful, as we heard from the child, than the original. This is who you are, Christian. You're a saint. Yeah, you don't take any credit for it. That's all a gift. And you're a sinner. You can take credit for that. <laughs> we love to take credit for something. I tell my pious friends, well, take credit for your sin. <laughs> they don't like that. Oh, but I found Jesus. No, Jesus found you. Get over yourself. <laughs> no. We are saint and sinner always in this life until the final day. Okay, I don't usually put things on the altar in my piety, but I'm doing it today. Uh, think about this. The parent, parents of a child born with all kinds of disabilities and illnesses, uh, they themselves, as you might know, often uh, have struggles, not just with the child, but with each other. Statistically, many of these parents divorce. I mean, it's just really difficult. It's hard. It's a struggle. And yet, those same parents, and I've known them over the years in all five congregations, have found ways, divorced or not, to come back and make amends and learn from their mistakes and then go and guide other people with children of the same ailment. Saint and sinner. You know, argued like heck come back together and realize there's something more important to do. There's an example. Uh, the AA sponsor, you know, who helps someone become sober, who himself is still addicted to alcohol. He's broken. And in his brokenness, he helps others. And in fact, I'll tell you this, just for free, I did 17 years of fifth steps. I'm not an alcoholic, I'm a social drinker, and I had all kinds of people in AA come to me, and one of the first things they would say is, now, pastor, I don't know you. Are you, are you an alcoholic? Uh, no, I'm not. I prefer an alcoholic. Why? You know. 
They've already got the alcoholic breaks in their life, and they know what that's like. And in their now new life of sobriety, they become more beautiful and helpful than someone without. I said, that's okay. There'll be others. There were plenty. Um, or think about, in fact, the teenager or parent who says something extremely hurtful and, and didn't mean to. I mean, it came out of his mouth before he even knew it one day and really hurts that child, and the next day does something so marvelous that that child falls in love with his parent all over again. Why? Because in the brokenness, God uses everything we got. Good stuff, bad stuff. Magnificent things, things that are not so magnificent. God is God. God gets to use whatever God wants. And God wants you. And your brokenness, and your cracks, your cracks. I sometimes call us cracked pots. <laughs> we are, aren't we? We're cracked pots. And God loves cracked pots. God only loves sinners, after all. And God loves you and all your cracks and everything that wasn't perfect in your life. Okay. On this day in the gospel, Jesus climbs up that hill and he speaks. Nine times, about nine things, beatitudes we call them, blessings. And you know what they are. All right. Blessed, and you heard me emphasize the word are, blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble. Blessed are those who can have their hearts broken, the mourn, those who mourn. By the way, people who have their hearts broken are the luckiest people in the world. Those who can't have their hearts broken are not yet fully alive. They have cracks. God willing, those cracks will be used one day. Blessed are the meek. Yes. Blessed are those who right now hunger and thirst for what is right. And so on. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the peacemakers. I want to, I want to bring something up here. When you read in the scriptures about God in the Old Testament, Jesus in the New Testament, there's something that is similar. It's about speaking. When God speaks in the Old Testament, what happens? Things get created. The first blades of grass got created at his voice, at God's speaking. Um, the first trees grew. You know, the waters came together as God spoke things happen. That's the narrative. That's our story, see? When Jesus in the New Testament speaks, what happens? Well, let me give you a couple examples you already know about. You remember that day there was a crowd and there was a woman from Samaria, Gospel of John. She was a sinner and there were rules about sinners, right? As there are today. And especially the men were very anxious and eager to use the law which was in place to stone her, right? You know, that was the law. And Jesus, who was a master, a challenge and repost, they said to him, Jesus, she is an adulterer. The law says to kill her. Oh yes, said Jesus, the law does say that. So, uh, of you men with all these big stones in your hand, the first one who hasn't sinned, you throw the first stone. What happened? You heard the thud. One thud, another thud, all these big rocks going to the ground, and the men walking away in anger. Because when Jesus speaks, there is redemption, renewal, reconciliation, and love. Words are a power for God. That's why John, in his gospel, says, Jesus is the word of God. I'm going to flesh that out next week in the forum, Bible study, faith study. No, words are very powerful. When, when I proposed to Becky, on my knees, I might add, uh, up in Minnesota, Preacher's Point in Itasca Park, <laughs> I was so romantic. <laughs> I had the ring that she didn't know in a coffee can of cookies that my mother had made. She was visiting. But when she said yes, the sky opened and the earth shook in my life. Why? Because words are power. They're not just words. They're not just sounds in the air. 
They have power when we say them, and especially when God says them. Oh, you remember that day Jesus spoke and the wind stood still in the Lake Sea of Galilee? By the way, ask me this sometime. I actually calmed the uh, Sea of Galilee. I was there once. There was a wind, and I actually calmed it by accident. <laughs> it's a good story. You remember the day Jesus spoke and at five little loaves of bread and two little fish fed how many people? 5,000. You know these stories, you guys. I love it. Yes, when Jesus speaks, things happen. Now, Jesus on that hillside, let's, let's move into the hillside. On that mountain, when he speaks these words, blessed are the poor in spirit, he is creating in them at that moment humility. And these are not aspirations that you get graded on somehow. That if only I could be meek, if only I could be a peacemaker, stop it. You know, uh, Jesus creates what Jesus wants from us. What God commands, God gives us. This is the good news. See, this is why life is hilarious. That we don't even have to come up with it. We don't have to jump, jump down in our soul and find some table and tinker around and make uh, humility. The Spirit of God is making it in you, actually, right now, in the hearing of these words. There's power to Jesus' words. There's power to faith. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Yes, all of these things. And we are called, yes, commanded by Jesus to live the life of shalom in the Old Testament, the gospel in the New Testament, which is where we bless the world through our lives by letting Jesus' light and love and goodness shine through. 9,000 Palestinians have been killed. And even more than that, every day it, it horribly killed. We know this. And by the way, that includes Lutherans in Gaza who are part of the al Kalima University. It's the Lutheran University for anybody, mostly Muslims, but some Lutherans and Methodists and so on. Uh, four of them have been killed in Gaza. But the overwhelming, of course, are these Muslims Beautiful people made in God's image, mostly women and children, as you know. It's horrific and unexcusable. Uh, 1,400 Israelis, same thing, lost their lives and their loved ones, buried in rubble, burned alive, some of them. I mean, it is an awful thing. What does it mean to be a saint in today's world? Not just in your family, which you are, but globally. You know, and and you just, you're going to get this for free because I'm a retired bishop. In chapter 4 of your missional statement, you don't know what I'm talking about, the Constitution. <laughs> your Constitution is a missional statement. It's not just you know, what you do when somebody does something wrong. That's what people think, so they never read it, including me. I never read it until I was like in my third call. <laughs> That's because I had good congregations that overlooked everything that I did, see? All right. Uh, chapter 4 of your constitution, Agnes Day Lutheran, which is the same as your Stinted Constitution, which is the same as the ELCA Constitution. These are all required. The church is a people created by God in Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, called and sent to bear witness to God's creative, redeeming, and sanctifying activity in the congregation? World. Thank you. I forgot what it was. The world. 4D. Serve in response to God's love to meet human needs. Caring for the sick and aged. Advocating dignity, justice, and equity for all people. Working for peace. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the peacemakers. Making you a peacemaker. Even in this horrific situation. We're not bereft of things that we can do. Uh, did I finish this? Oh, uh, working for peace and reconciliation among the nations, caring for the marginalized, embracing and welcoming racially and ethnically diverse populations, and standing in solidarity with the poor and oppressed, committing itself to their needs. This is a huge command, but you know what? You're not doing this alone, see? 
You are a saint, one through whom the light shines. Oh, imperfectly, yes, I know. Don't worry about it. God takes the cracks of our lives, you crackpots, and uses that to bring blessing and grace and love. The church is a sign of this gospel. And the church is an embodiment of this gospel. And if you happen to do, uh, have this great, magnificent, benevolent gene one day, and you want to do something and you didn't do it right, don't worry about it. Click up your heels and be glad that God is still with you, see? You know, I say all that because we've been plagued in our culture by this perfectionism that a lot of Christians in this country are a slave to. And it's all baloney. It's complete baloney. Um, where most of American Christians have a Calvinist bent and all this kind of stuff, they don't realize that God uses broken people who are saints, all wrapped up together in one beautiful body. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was going to save this till Advent, but it works so well with this that I have another object. You're getting a lot of objects these days. This is what happens when you're a camp chaplain for a couple of years. <laughs> so the second lesson says, we are God's children right now. Already. Yeah, nothing, don't worry about it. You don't have to strive for it. You know, these pious people, God bless them. Um, you get over it. God's always recreating the life of Christ in you. But this is your life. By the way, I got this from Father Robert Capon, a marvelous Episcopal priest that I've met on a couple occasions in Canada. He's dead now. He was also a New York chef, and he wrote recipes. And he was also a Greek expert and theologian. He was a priest in, uh, Episcopal priest in Long Island. He said, uh, this is your life. Only he had a, uh, what are those little balls they used to have that you poke and it comes out again? I'll think of it. This is a squeeze ball, so I can squeeze it down to a thimble if I wanted to. And it's different than its original shape, which is a beautiful, round, yellow ball. All right? It's your life. Are you following me? You have a temporal grip on your life. There it is. There's Tom. There's my life. I get to make decisions. I make some good ones. I make some half-baked ones. I make some rotten ones, I'll be honest. And when I do that, it's like I squeeze that perfect round ball into an ugly shape. And the next day I realize, oh, that wasn't very good, but I said to, you know, Henry. And I go back and I apologize. And the ball comes back just the way God wanted it, see. Asking for forgiveness, living in shalom, living the gospel, letting the light come through. Oh, but a week later I do the same thing to another friend. It's even worse. Can't help myself sometimes. Do we know of any one of the apostles that said that? Did, did not St. Paul say, Oh, wretched man that I am. This is after he knows Christ. Oh, the good that I would do, I don't do. And the rotten stuff that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Wretched man that I am, who will save me? And then he says, Christ will. There's a second grip on your hand all your life. Over your hand, see, it's Christ. The whole New Testament. And the whole business about the end of the world is all about this cosmic Christ who has his hand on your hand. And he, he doesn't stop the rotten things. He's just there to hold you all the way through. Keep on working with you and me. Keep on taking the crack pots that we are and putting gold in it. See, love. Beautiful things. And uh, one day we die. Thank God. Thank God we die. Because that's our ticket home. And we release our grip with all the punch marks we got in there. Even if we're at the last, I've, I've been to some dying people's bedside where beautiful things were said. And I've been to some where rotten things were said. You know what? You die and you let go and Christ takes it and your life is perfect. And he brings it to the Father and says, here you go, Father. Aiken, just the way you wanted him. Free from that sin side. See, that's the promise. And I tell you that because it's only people who know they're loved who can take flight in love. We had, uh, we had some political people, I won't make any names, who never felt loved. 
We should understand this. And that's why no love could come out of him. It's only when we know that that hand is over our life that we can take a risk. And at the end of the day, at the end of the world, Jesus brings us to the Father. There you are, see. So I say, saint and sinner, live into it with courage. I like the way Luther said it. He said, sin boldly. <laughs> Now, just so you know, maybe you know what that means. He didn't mean go out and hurt someone. He meant that most of what we do in our crackpot lives of saint and sinner has a little bit of selfishness in it already. But don't let that stop you from doing something good. See? Sin boldly. And then he said, you know this, and trust Christ more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>